Hello and welcome to RERA's Community Emergency Committee. We do a monthly presentation on emergency preparedness and we're happy you could join the meeting. Today is September 23rd. The time is about 8 p.m. And today we will be directing our attention towards a couple topics of interest. We meet monthly and the idea is rather than have a single meeting once a year on emergency preparedness, we do this on a regular monthly basis. These meetings are held via Zoom webinar on the fourth Thursday of every month at 8 p.m. So welcome to the webinar. Again, my name is Frank Ferranch. I'm the chair of the committee. And let's start the presentation. So today's agenda is going to focus on a couple of topics. We're going to look at, do we evacuate or do we shelter in place? We're going to look at easy steps towards building your own go bag. Last night, uh, there was a REAC uh, presentation on emergency preparedness, where public safety, New York City Emergency Management, and the 114 precinct presented helpful ideas on emergency preparedness. And this follows up specifically on details with respect to packing your own go bag. We're also going to review shelter in place and a stay box, which you might not have heard of yet. These are both useful. So in our monthly presentation, there are a couple slides that remain the same in every presentation. There's only a couple, but the reason for presenting them every time is to remind ourselves of the big plan. In emergency response, there are actually four main cycles that go on. So we prepare for an emergency, we respond to emergency, after the emergency, we recover from the emergency, and beyond recovery, and then hopefully before preparation, we mitigate from that emergency. And by mitigate, I mean that we look to change things so in the future, the effects of an emergency is less or possibly eliminated. And the cycle continues every time. So that's the overall cycle. Today, what we will be talking about is preparation for an emergency and a little bit on responding to emergency, your initial steps. This is another slide that we repeat every time. And that's because this is the very big goal. This is the community-wide goal, which is to build resilience. So resiliency is the ability to recover from or adjust to adversity or change. This has actually been studied as uh, communities who are resilient to disasters. And then there are communities that are not. And what they discovered was that your ability to recover, your resiliency, is not tied to economic status. So maybe richer communities did not do so well in recovering from a disaster, whereas poorer communities were able to. So it's not tied to economic status, it's not tied to social status, and it's not tied to race or ethnicity. What it is tied to is social connections. And that's something that we emphasize every time because social connections are not something that you create overnight. It's something that you can start, you can start today. You can talk to your neighbors, 
You can talk to people that you see every day, but you don't really engage too much in the conversation. And these are the people that you might talk to before, during, and after a storm, let's say. And, and they're, you're, they're the people you might be, you, you might be asking for help. They might be asking for help, but, and, and these are, and these are people that most likely are friends, family, and neighbors. So think about one more social connection that you can build starting today. This is the, this is described in a booklet called Community Emergency Planning. It's created by New York City Emergency Management, and it describes community disaster networks, also known as community emergency networks. And it's about how to put together collections of people that pitch in and help as a community during a disaster. Isn't there, in fact, is an electronic version of this toolkit. And if you go to the link on the screen, you'll be able to get download a copy of that, which has a uh, PDF version that you can fill in the, uh, the blanks in, in the PDF. You can also just print it and, and use a pen, and that works just as well, too. All the links in this presentation will be available in the description below. So when we talk about hazards, and there are different hazards during different seasons and different times of the year, there is one authoritative information source that everyone should subscribe to. It's called Notify NYC. You see the link there. And you can get important messages on whether it's thunderstorms, tornadoes, snow, rain, uh, hurricanes, flooding, and so on. You can get all of that in Notify NYC. It's your official source of information about the city with respect to emergencies. And this helps in our preparedness. That's an important step you can take. So you know that if you sign up for Notify NYC and you can get the messages uh, via email, via text message, or even via voice, as in it's a message that will call your phone and you'll hear someone on the other end with a recorded message giving you the information. You can get all options. You can get it on more than one phone or more than one email address. It's very, very, very helpful and it's a critical part of being prepared in New York City. Now, what's in it for you? Being prepared can save lives. It can save the lives of you, family, friends, and pets. Remember, pets are part of the family. It can also save lives in your neighborhood and your community. One of the things that you will discover about being prepared is that it reduces stress. So there's day-to-day -day stress, like, oh, it's August and September, and this is the peak of hurricane season. Boy, I'm worried about a hurricane, and I don't know what to do, okay? So if you're prepared, then you have less stress because you have more information on knowing what to do. Stress before hazard. Well, I just mentioned hurricane, but maybe there's a snowstorm that's coming, or maybe there's a power failure that's imminent because let's say it's summertime, there's a heat wave and a lot of people using their air conditioners and they're saying conserve power and there might be a power failure. And you can be stressed about that, or you can be more prepared and that reduces the stress. So there's stress in planning for <laughs> the hazard itself. This is sort of like 
stress about stress. Um, so some people think, oh, I should be doing this. Oh, I should be building my go bag or my stay kit, or I should be filling out the form. And they're stressed on that. And they don't really know where to get started. Well, there's step-by-step plans to get you started. And you can do it not all in one day, but over maybe the course of a couple weeks, just devoting 30 to 60 minutes each week to getting there. And that reduces stress. There can be stress in reacting to a hazard. Who doesn't feel stress when there's a hazard on us, whether it's a hurricane or power failure and such? Of course, we're all in stress, but we prepare for it, then we know what the things to do. Like, for example, shelter in place or evacuation. Those are our two main actions when reacting to a hazard. There can be stress during the hazard, which is, okay, I'm stuck in my house or my apartment for several days. The power has been out. Do I have enough supplies? Where am I getting information from on what's the next things to do? Where do I go? What do I do? Who can help me? So being prepared can reduce that kind of stress. And there can be stress from recovering from a hazard. So there are things that, oh, for example, it flooded and all my important documents got destroyed. Well, as I say here, an ounce of prevention, that's an example of something that you can do. You can take all your documents, put them in a waterproof container, put them high up outside the flooding area, and you can also make digital copies or paper copies. Again, you'll see that in the recommendations later on. And that can reduce stress. So preparedness is to help you, your family, and your community become more resilient. This is another slide that we show every time, except we change the focus. So what are the kinds of hazards that we're worried about? So today we're focused on coastal storms. So that would be like a hurricane or a nor'easter and flood. There are other kinds of uh, hazards, typically during the summer, such as tornado and heat wave. In the fall, we have nor'easters and uh, the storm drains, uh, you know, the grates out in the streets that get leaves on them and sometimes cause flooding. In the winter, snow, blizzard, cold. Uh, the sewer system reacts differently to ice and cold and there can be sewer main breaks. There's icing uh, and there's also transportation hazards with respect to snow and ice. In spring, uh, again, the water mains react uh, in, in the, uh, the thawing of the ground. And uh, there are air pollution and pollen problems in the spring. In any season, you can have power failure. You can have transportation issues. There can be a fire or explosion. There can be structural issues such as an earthquake. Uh, th there can be health issues such as a pandemic, which everyone is aware of. And there can be combinations. And so this is sort of a, uh, a short list of all the possible hazards. And we take an all hazards approach towards this. But today we're focusing on some of the summer hazards, which is coastal storm and flood. I believe this is the second to last slide that we show every time, which is New York City Emergency Management has a program called Ready New York, which is to make New Yorkers ready for hazards. And they go into a lot more detail on the kinds of hazards here. You'll see about 15 or 20 hazards on the page. And if you go on that link, then you'll find all of the information on, for example, carbon monoxide and what the hazard is 
and how do you address the hazard? How do you become prepared for it? How do you respond? How do you uh, recover and how do you mitigate? So we're on to the presentation. So again, we're going to go over, should we evacuate or should we shelter in place? Building, building your own go bag, some of the easy steps and the stay box, which is used for shelter in place. I will take questions if we have enough time. So evacuation or shelter in place. Generally, these are the two main responses to an emergency. So evacuation, what that means is leaving the place where you presently are at. So if you're at home, it means leaving home. If you're at work, it means leaving work. If you're at school, it means leaving school and so on. Determining where to go and what to do. And contacting people you know to let them know how you're doing, your well being, and where your location is so they know where you're at. For evacuation, we use a go bag to support our act of evacuating. <clears throat> Now, most people think of having a go bag at home because that's the images that we mostly see, but you can also have another go bag at work. Shelter in place is another approach towards responding to an emergency. So shelter in place is sort of the opposite of evacuation instead of leaving where you presently are, you're staying where you presently are. So you might be staying at home and possibly staying at home for a couple of days. You might be staying at home, but moving to a different place in your home. Uh, the same applies for work. You might be staying at work, but a different place at work. Furthermore, you might be taking additional protective actions while you're staying at home or at work, or wherever you're at. For example, you might be turning the refrigerator down to its lowest setting in response to one kind of hazard, or you might be taping the windows to make sure the windows are sealed for a different type of hazard. When you are sheltering in place, you'll, you will have a stay box, which you'll be using for your supplies. Now, a stay box is, could be a single box, but depending upon where you live or work, it might be more than one box. So for evacuation, the most important decision-making moment is understanding the timing. And there's three kinds of timings with respect to evacuation. The first is right now. When I say right now, I mean right now within seconds, not 60 seconds from now, right now. So for example, a fire would be something that you would evacuate, assuming it was uh, in a house uh, or in your apartment or uh, in a non-fireproof building, you would be evacuating within seconds. Maybe there's an explosion or you smell gas or there's some structural damage, like something happened and you see a crack on the wall and you realize that your apartment or your house has some structural damage. You're leaving within seconds, not minutes seconds. Another kind of timing is quickly, where you have maybe seconds to minutes. So a flash flood is something that we've seen recently with Hurricane Ida, but these have happened 
many times and we regularly get flash flood warnings. So a flash flood means that there's water coming very quickly. So a storm surge, which you've probably aware of in hurricanes, uh, come, can come on gradually. A flash flood comes because, let's say, there's a thunderstorm and it's raining heavily near you and the area is flooding very quickly. In this case, you have seconds to minutes. And when I second, when I say seconds, this is on the order of maybe 30 seconds to two to three minutes. And so what does that mean? How would you react differently than right now? Maybe you might have enough time to shut off your utilities. So if your house uh, or your place floods, there won't be an electrical fire or the water won't be running or there won't be a gas fire. You're able to turn off all of that quickly within possibly a minute or so. And then that gives you the opportunity to get out but take some protective actions for your place uh, all within seconds to minutes. And we're not going to cover that today. I'm just pointing out generally there are three time scales for this right now, quickly. Uh, and then the last one is advance notice where you might have hours to days uh, advance notice. So a good example of that would be a hurricane where we see on the news Oh, there's a hurricane down in the Caribbean and just making its way up the East Coast. It's expected to come to New York uh, in maybe three or four days. Lots of advance notice, even two days. That's advance notice. So looking above on the quickly time frame, you don't have time to back up your computer on quickly. You just have time to shut off the utilities and run. For advance notice, maybe you do have time to back up the computer. Maybe you do have time to rearrange things to higher ground. Um, so you have a little more time for preparation of that. And so things like hurricane and storm surge and riverine flooding and riverine flooding is different from storm surge flooding and different from aerial flooding. And uh, I'll just quickly explain. So aerial flooding would come from the sky. In other words, thunderstorms and rain. Uh, riverine flooding comes from rivers. So it may be raining somewhere else, but it's raining up in the mountains and all that water is now coming down into the rivers. And then if you're nearby a river, uh, the river might start to flood. And storm surge flooding comes from the high winds in a hurricane that push a wall of water and that wall of water can be as high as 20 feet depending upon the severity of the storm but that storm surge will come uh, in hours before the hurricane and will last through the hurricane but it's in the last category here which is you will have some uh, some advance notice from hours to days to react to this. So for evacuation, if we're ready to run out of the house or the apartment within seconds, the best place for that go bag is having it ready right at the exit door. So where you're leaving the house or the apartment, get a hook, put it on the door, maybe get a hook and uh, put it on next to the door, but it should be available so you can grab it. You don't have to think about it. You grab it and you run. So in this case here, you grab the go bag, you quickly leave, and then when safe, call 911 if there's an emergency to report, such as a fire or a gas leak. I will mention and reinforce that if there's a fire, make sure you close the door behind you because fires will quickly spread and we've lost firefighters 
because of fires that spread when people left doors open. So leave the door unlocked, but closed. So I say here, when it's safe to call 911, I'm sure everyone says call 911 right away when there's emergency. Well, the more important thing calling 911 is for you to be safe. So if there's a gas leak, don't sit in the, in, in the house or the apartment saying, I think I'll call 911. First, get out of the, uh, get out of, uh, the house or apartment. And when you're uh, at safety, then call 911. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to be uh, part of the people that need help just by waiting as you're trying to call 911 and you're in the midst of uh, some danger, get to safety first. And typically that will be once you've gotten out of your house, apartment building or place of work. So, but then call 911 if appropriate. Shelter in place is the other kind of reaction to an emergency. So again, we have the same types of timing, but our reactions are now shelter in place. So let's, let's go over a couple of these. So we still have right now within seconds. So a good example would be an earthquake and a tornado. Of course, with an earthquake, you're going to be getting under some sturdy table and holding on and covering your head. And those aren't too, too common. Those are pretty rare in the New York City area. But tornadoes happen regularly. And they happen typically when there are severe thunderstorms or hurricanes or nor'easters. They will all be ahead of the storm. So those happen more than we think. Not like um, Oklahoma, where we might imagine that's where that's Tornado Alley. In New York, we, we get tornadoes and they can be just as devastating as we see in other parts of the country. And so you need to react to a tornado within seconds, not within seconds to minutes, but within seconds, like right now, like less than 30 seconds. That's how much time you have to respond to a tornado. And we'll get to what your response is. Uh, but you're going to be saying, uh, at home or at work during that and going to an inside room away from windows and walls. Now, I mentioned on the prior slide that you evacuate when there's a fire, such as in your apartment or in your building. If, there's a, if your building is not fireproof, which would be a typical structure made of wood, uh, these might be small, like five-story apartment buildings and such. That's non-fireproof. And if there's a fire elsewhere in the building, you need to get out right away because the fire can spread. Newer buildings and typically taller buildings are fireproof buildings, which means that they're made of cement. There are barriers among apartments. And so a fire elsewhere in the building does not mean that you should leave. In fact, you should stay in your apartment. Now, the actual authoritative source on this for every apartment would be a sticker that the landlord puts on the backside of your front door and, and the fire plan for that building. Those are the official directions on what you should do uh, in case there's a fire in your building. So follow them. So those, the timing of those two are right now, as in uh, those are both shelter in place. The second timing category is quickly from seconds to minutes. So a thunderstorm would be an example of that. So you hear thunder, you know there's a storm around you, you have seconds to minutes to respond to that. So one thing you might do is you might unplug appliances just in case there's a uh, 
some electrical activity, lightning strikes uh, the power lines. That applies in some parts of New York City because, for example, in, in the four boroughs other than Manhattan, the power lines are above ground in Manhattan, they're below ground. This would be a good time if you have a computer to shut it down and disconnect it. And it would also be time to, uh, if you have people who are showering or in the bathtub, to get out of the shower or bathtub. You want to stay away from plumbing because plumbing is made of metal and it connects to the ground system. And there can be some currents that flow uh, when lightning strikes and it hits the local uh, uh, power lines. Third category in shelter in place is advance notice. So a heat wave uh, or cold snap or snowstorm. It can also be a hurricane if you're on higher ground. So you would check your uh, evacuation zones and your elevation levels and determine if you're on higher ground, you're probably sheltering in place. Same for, as I mentioned, the heat wave you're probably sheltering in place unless you don't have air conditioning, in which case you'd be going to a cooling center. Same would apply with a cold snap, unless you don't have heat, in which case you're going to a warming center and a snowstorm, you're most likely staying at home and sheltering in place. Now, like we have a go bag for evacuations, we have a stay box for when you stay at home. In the stay box, there's more stuff than you have in the go bag. And you have a disaster plan, which you should follow those instructions that you've already uh, prepared. And if appropriate, uh, such as a, a fire elsewhere in the building, because they're going to want to know about you if there's, there's a fire elsewhere in the building when you're sheltering in place. So that would be a good time to call 911 um, or an earthquake. Again, call 911. So now, how to make that decision? Evacuate or shelter in place? Well, there's guidance based upon the hazard type. So hurricane, uh, snowstorm, and so on like that. But there's also guidance based upon your present building type. When I say present, that's the one that you're actually in at that moment. So there are three main categories, mobile and manufactured homes. And we don't have them on Roosevelt Island, uh, but they might exist uh, elsewhere where you're at in another community. And so you know the right thing to do. We don't have one or two story buildings on uh, Roosevelt Island for our residents. There is a church on the north end of the island. That would be an example of a one-story building. So if you happen to be there. But otherwise, these would apply more such as in residential communities like Astoria and Long Island City, but not Roosevelt Island. Multi-story high-rise buildings, well, that describes all the residential housing on Roosevelt Island. FEMA has guidance sheets on this based upon building type and based upon hazard. We're going to look at a couple of them later in this webinar. Oh, they're already here. So as I mentioned, there's a, the first category is a manufactured or a mobile home. So I think most people know what a mobile home is. Looks like something that you would carry with a pickup truck and you would uh, set it down in a place like a mobile home trailer park and that's where you'd be living. Now it's a structure that's relatively small. It's very lightweight and it is not sturdy construction. A manufactured home is like a mobile home but it's where you have two or three pieces that you've brought together 
and then joined at wherever uh, wherever you've brought them to so that it's typically a wider mobile home. So those two kinds of homes are dangerous in certain hazards. So if we look at the screen here, we see um, almost a dozen hazards. And the first one on the top left is active shooter. We're not going to go into active shooter, but I'm sure you've heard of run, hide, and fight in terms of the response to an active shooter. First choice is get away from the active shooter, run. Second choice is if you can escape, then hide. Um, and if you can't avoid confrontation, then fight. Now, run, hide, fight, that applies in every type of housing configuration. And as I said, we're not going to talk on active shooter. What we will see if we go to the bottom here, we see, see tornado and tornado is evacuate. You need to get out of that mobile home. It's flimsy when, with respect to a tornado. And not only will the home be severely damaged, you might suffer severe injury or death. So the choice in that is to evacuate immediately. Uh, same with a hurricane, again, for the high winds and such. But we don't have too many of these on Roosevelt Island, so I just wanted to mention that this is one approach. Um, one or two story building, you'll see that, as I had mentioned, active shooter is the same, run, hide, or fight. Um, and I will just say one thing about this uh, with respect to flooding is that, uh, so these might be uh, detached houses, these might be row houses, as are familiar uh, in uh, many neighborhoods in New York City, whether it's Astoria or Park Slope or the Upper East Side, these are examples of row houses and 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 one or two story buildings. Now, with respect to flooding on this, because you might be in this, one of the things that the they say in terms of a general strategy on flooding is go to higher ground. If you're in a building, maybe that means a higher floor. Okay. But do not go to the attic because the attic uh, may have no exit. You may be trapped up the attic and then die uh, because the flooding got too high. What I just said about the attic also applies to the basement. So if there's flooding, get out of the basement. Get out of the basement. Don't think that that's going to be a place to shelter uh, in place. Um, if you're in a building where you're a basement tenant uh, and the landlord lives in the upper floors of the house, I'm sure they will be sympathetic to letting you stay there for the duration of the flood, but you cannot stay in your basement. And likewise, if you're going to higher ground, you cannot go to the attic. If, if that seems like you have to go higher you, sh you should have already called 911 and go to the roof but do not go to the attic because there's no exit for you and you may be trapped and again for the basement always out of the basement okay and again this applies for people on roosevelt island because they might be at a place um uh, when a hazard arises that they need to take the appropriate action, which might be they're at a friend's or relative's, and they're in a one or two story building, and they should know the way to react. And I would say, again, the key things are, don't go to the attic and get out of the basement right away. <clears throat> Multi-story buildings. Well, this is where Roosevelt Island residents live exclusively. They're all in high rise buildings. And we see that there are a variety of ac uh, actions here. Um, <clears throat> when I said earlier on that we evacuate or shelter in place for 
most of these, these are shelter in place. The exception would be if there's a flooding issue and they order evacuations, in which case you should follow the appropriate instructions and do what those instructions are, whether they're from the building manager or from the city. So multi-story buildings are mostly shelter in place. But if you remember from the, uh, the slide a couple slides ago, is that you might be taking protective actions once you've determined that you're sheltering in place. I'm going to go over them right now. So we've taken that <clears throat> uh, chart, that infographic, and we've blown it up a bit because it, it's too hard to read. As I had mentioned, active shooter, run, hide, and fight. Uh, for a hurricane, it says here, shelter in place, uh, go to a sturdy building. For high wind, go to a windowless room on the lowest level, okay? But for flooding, go as high as possible, but not into the attic. So for winds, you want an interior room. For flooding, you want a higher floor. For th thunderstorms, again, it's shelter in place. And it says here what to do, pay, pay attention to weather reports, be ready to change plans if necessary, unplug appliances, I had mentioned that, avoid using running, wa running water or landline phones. Uh, the old landline phones were a direct wire connection to the old te telephone company central offices. Mostly they are gone now and we have some type of digital connection. So the wired connection is um, uh, doesn't apply. It still might apply in some places on Roosevelt Island, but uh, stay away from anything that's connected. Uh, to any type of electricity. For a winter storm, again, we're going to shelter in place and limit time outside. But again, the protective actions are different. So we want to avoid carbon monoxide poisoning uh, uh, when using generators or grills, uh, which should be used only outdoors. I would say for Roosevelt Island, you should not be using either um, and you can't use grills outdoors. So I'll just say, make sure there's no open flame. Sometimes people use kerosene heaters and such. There should be no open flame in your apartment. For flooding, uh, we shelter in place, but go to the highest level in the building, but not in the attic, as I mentioned. And if the flood waters rise to a dangerous level, get on the roof and call 911. And I, if, the, if the flood levels require us getting on the roof on Roosevelt Island, well, I'd say it's the end of the world. But uh, there's a reason to not be in the flood waters. We think of it just as. Uh, flood waters as in it's just water, but the water has incredible amount of contaminants and pollutants in it. So stay out of it. It's stuff that will leach into your skin and which has disease and stuff. And we don't have alligators uh, in New York, but there are other kinds of animals like rats and stuff like that, that are actually in the flood waters. If you saw the Hurricane Ida video, I think there's a rat swimming in one of the water, uh, the water flows. So uh, stay out of the flood waters. Also, flood waters uh, can cover things on the ground. Do not go in the flood waters. Um, so, for example, don't drive in them. Don't walk in them. All it takes is six inches of moving water to knock your knock you down. It's it's it's, it's surprising. Six inches of water can knock you down and cause you to fall in the moving waters and then get dragged away. Only 12 inches will move a car and 18 inches 
will definitely move an SUV. So stay out of moving waters. Don't go into moving waters. Don't drive into moving waters. I'll also point out, especially when walking, that uh, many times the sewer caps, uh, you see the manhole covers, they come off because the water and the way it's flooding comes from within the sewer system and pushes up and pushes the manhole cover off. So you don't actually see there's a hazard there. And when you're walking, you can fall into that and then uh, possibly become unconscious as you hit the metal falling into it and then drown underneath. So stay away from floods. Don't walk into any water or any area where you cannot see what is beneath you. So the next slide is pandemic. Well, I think all New Yorkers are experienced on what to do in a pandemic, which is to shelter in place, stay at home, minimize access uh, to your home from anyone uh, not isolating with you. Um, I'm going to skip over this because we've been told this on a daily basis and everyone I'm sure is expert at this. Chemical hazard. Again, you're going to shelter in place and stay inside your home and you want to seal the room. So this is where the duct tape comes out and you seal the windows. Um, this you want to tape over vents and any electrical outlets. Why electrical outlets? Because there's a way for air to be exchanged through electrical outlets, the conduit behind the wall. Now, this same approach you'll see in the next slide, there's nuclear and uh, radiological and biological uh, hazard. In this case here, your reaction is pretty much the same, which is you're sheltering in place, you're sealing up the house or apartment. And it says here, drink stored water, not water from the tap, and turn off the air conditioner, heater, and fans. Close the fireplace uh, damper. Let us not apply on Roosevelt Island. And seal any other place where air may come from outside. OK. Um, earthquake, again, those are not frequent but you'll shelter in place, stay where you are, take cover, get under uh, uh, sturdy furniture until the shaking stop, uh, protect your head and neck with your arms. So drop, cover, and hold uh, are the main, is the main phrase there. So you drop, get down, cover, make sure your head's covered, your head and neck are covered, and then hold on uh, to something so you don't uh, you don't move. Okay. And then the last of these four panels here um, concerns nuclear and radiological, which I've already mentioned that the, the response is the same as chemical. Uh, for tornado, shelter in place, go to a basement or the lowest level in the structure, go to a small interior and windowless room in a sturdy building on the lowest level. Okay. So in review, we need to react and, and we evacuate when we smell gas, there's a building collapse or cracks in the wall, uh, fire in apartment, or it's a non-fireproof building and the fire is elsewhere in the building. If that's the case, then grab the go bag, immediately exit and close the door behind you so the fire doesn't spread. Once you've gotten to safety, then call 911. We shelter in place when there is a fire outside your apartment and only in a fireproof building. Again. Check the fire plan for your building. We shelter in place when we can't evacuate or it's unsafe to evacuate. Or we shelter in place when advised to shelter in place. Then we access our stay box, which is at home. We listen for information from authoritative sources. 
like Notify NYC, but uh, the uh, radios, the AM, FM radios, they work too. We confirm our emergency water supply, flashlights and batteries. Why? Because maybe it's daylight at that point and it's good to find where all our pieces are rather than, and then when it gets dark, say, oh, where was that flashlight? Well, it's too late at that point. Uh, we can serve refrigeration by turning the refrigerator to the lowest level. And if the power goes out, then at least we've made it the lowest uh, temperature, which will preserve our food the longest. So making a go bag, and this is for evacuation. So you need to have one for each person in the households. So if there are two adults and three children, that's five go bags. And when I say five go bags, the size of the bag should be different depending upon the size of the child. So a teenager might be able to carry a go bag the same size as an adult, but a four-year-old will not. They still should have a go bag, but only a small amount of stuff in it. And again, if you're traveling as a family, collectively what's in those go bags would support the family. Uh, the child, the four-year-old child doesn't need to carry everything in his or her bag. It might be in a sibling's bag or also in a parent's bag. But just remember, each person has a go bag. Don't forget pets. Pets have go bags too, except they are uh, tailored to the needs of pets. And we're not gonna go into that in this presentation, but uh, if you can look at the New York City Emergency Management and look for a uh, pamphlet on my pets in an emergency. So you're gonna gather your emergency supply kit. And that includes a first aid kit. You should have a first aid kit in every go bag, even if you're traveling as a family. You should have the right kind of toiletries. You would be surprised as to how well a half roll of paper, half roll of toilet paper fits nicely into every go bag in contrast to a whole roll of toilet paper. You should have some cash so these are singles and $5 bills, maybe with some quarters as coins. Uh, somewhere between $50 and $100 would probably be the right amount. You should have uh, any special needs that you have. Maybe you have a nebulizer and you need to have that special equipment. There are COVID-19 supplies that you should have. So you should have extra masks because you're going to lose yours it's going to break you should have gloves so the medical gloves and uh, you should have a good supply of hand sanitizer the other things that are in the pictures here include uh, don't forget the toothbrush and the toothpaste uh, extra glasses the glasses might get lost at some point, and if your vision is really poor, you're really stranded. So have an extra set or two of glasses. They might be an old pair whose prescription is close but not perfect, or maybe you get an extra pair, but don't forget the extra pair of glasses. You need a notepad and a uh, pencil uh, or pen because you will have to write things down in your journey uh, in your evacuation. Of course, really any bag can be used, but find one that you can carry and fits nicely on you. Best to put them on your back because that leaves your hands and arms free to do other things. A whistle is really important. A whistle is important whether at home or in a go bag, because let's say you're in a dark hallway because the power is out, Shouting might not work as well as blowing a whistle. Everyone's going to hear that whistle and they're going to come uh, seek out the person who's blowing that whistle, whereas your voice might be tired or not strong enough to convey uh, your, your voice long distances. 
um, flashlight and batteries. This is old school flashlight and batteries. Uh, these days, I recommend uh, above that in, or instead of that is to get a large USB battery, the kind there are about uh, 25,000 milliamp hours. And that would be about the same weight what would be more useful and, and get one that has a built-in flashlight. So it doubles as a flashlight and can power your USB devices. A bottle of water in the bag. So take like uh, either a half liter, that's 16 ounce, or a full liter bottle of water. Don't take more water because that water is very heavy. So a gallon of water is eight pounds. That's a lot of weight especially when going long distance. It's also bulky too. So take a, a bottle of water and that water bottle will be your friend in your journey because you're likely to refill it many times. So think of it as something that you will refill. And in anticipation of that, you might want to write your name on the water bottle and permanent marker because when filling bottles of water and such, they all look the same. And this way, you know which one is yours. Granola bars are listed here. What we're really looking for here is a, a small compact amount of food that's in individual pieces that you can eat from time to time. Now, this might give you a day's worth of sustenance. But anything that's not dry and, uh, and packaged like this is going to be a big problem in terms of freshness and uh, and heat might, uh, for example, think of a chocolate bar in the heat, that's just going to be mush. So uh, find something, it doesn't have to be a granola bar, but something that size, you can take a half dozen of them that would last you a day and uh, they're neat and they don't uh, spoil and don't spoil other things in your go bag. And the last and most important thing is your medicines. Make sure you have a seven day supply of medicines. If you can make photocopies of the uh, prescriptions, that would be great. Now for a stay box at home for shelter in place, this is where we get to actually having large quantities of water. So expect to be there for seven days and uh, you can have one for the whole family. You don't need individual boxes. It's more convenient. You might want to store certain things separate from other things uh, in more than one box, but this is your stay box at home. So water is one gallon per person per day. So if you're planning on seven days, that's seven gallons for you individually. If there are two people, that's 14 gallons. It's a simple multiplication. You can buy gallon jugs of water uh, at the local supermarket. Just put them somewhere, but that will be your drinking water. For food, assume that you're eating cold food and then you're not preparing food and, uh, and the food should be ready to eat as in it doesn't require cooking. There might be no um, power, so the electric can openers are not going to work. Get a manual can opener to put in your stay box. You might have one in the kitchen, but just make sure all your supplies are in the stay box. You don't have to go looking for things. Uh, buckets for extra water to flush toilets. So the five gallon buckets like the big orange home depot buckets are useful if you see a storm coming and you know there's a possibility you might have to shelter in place that would be the time to fill those buckets into the bathtub so leave them in the bathtub and they will be there uh to help with flushing toilets and also uh to support uh washing and such so you're going to use them for washing and the gallon jugs for drinking. Uh, have a first aid ki uh, kit, family size. And that's not the same as the first aid kit that's in your go bag. You need to have at least two, one for your go bags, one for your stay box. 
uh, for communications. They have the battery powered or hand crank uh, AM FM radios and the emergency ones have the NOAA weather uh, channel, which will give you local weather uh, information. And that will be a way to get information on what to do. Most cell phones have an FM radio app because they are able to receive FM radio, which is interesting because the cell towers might be out. So your cell phones don't work, but they still work as a smart device. And the app that you can run on that is a FM radio app. Again, remember that you're using power in your device. So be sure that you have extra batteries such as a uh, USB, uh, large USB battery and such to support all of that. And that gets to the next thing, a USB charger, batteries, flashlights, and whistle. You'll always need a whistle, even at home, because uh, maybe you need to get someone's attention there out on the street and saying, hey, come here, is not the same as blowing a whistle, which will get everyone's attention. Don't forget your pets. They need supplies and food and water, too. So there's uh, a couple more things, and these, this is not an exhaustive list, but the emergency plan. Now that I had mentioned that before, that if you uh, search for uh, New York City Emergency Management, nice I'm there, Ready New York Emergency Plan, you'll get a copy of the plan. It's in PDF. You can print it out or fill in the blanks. That also covers a family communications plan. So how do we stay in touch with one another? That might uh, involve uh, contacting uh, Aunt Sally at Alabama, which is a good choice to have someone outside uh, our neighborhood and outside our city. And Aunt Sally in Alabama will know that if there's an emergency, that she will be the point where people are calling and checking in. I recommend against using things like Facebook to say I'm alive and such, because you're probably going to convey more information. There are a variety of privacy issues. Your best uh, option is to create a family communications plan. You should have alternate meeting locations. So maybe your first meeting location on Roosevelt Island might be at the church in the center of town next to the bell. Uh, and that that's a an example of a meeting location here on Roosevelt Island, but you should have another meeting location that is further away outside the community. So maybe in Astoria or Long Island City or in Manhattan or maybe somewhere else. It's important to have digital and paper copies of all your important documents. So digital copies, you can either store on your phone or on a USB stick and paper copies, um, those are just straight photocopies or scan copies and print it and have them in a waterproof bag, have at least two copies. As I mentioned, you'll need an extra supply of medicines and you'll need season appropriate clothing. So just packing your go bag and, uh, and you're running out now because it's summertime and you're evacuating and you discover you have an extra winter jacket in your go bag. Meanwhile, the temperature is 95 degrees. That's not helpful. And so we check our go bags twice a year. At the same time, we check the smoke detectors and all of the other things. And, uh, and that's the time when we set the clocks back or forward for daylight saving time. That would be a good time to check the clothes and the freshness of all of your supplies in your go bag and in your stay box. So this is the last slide. And again, the one that is, uh, I said there was one more slide that always appears. This is that slide, which is uh, the most important things. Prescriptions, have spare medications. As I said, the prescriptions might mean if you're at a place longer uh, than expected, you can get refills of your prescriptions. Uh, your medical documents and contact your doctors and such. 
on insurance papers and small cash and small bills and quarters. Remember, the singles and, uh, and $5 bills are good. You might have a $20 bill, but no one might have change. And that means maybe you spent $20 for that $1 bottle of water that you really need. So small bills. Make a meeting place an alternative. I had mentioned that. Um, make a list of points of contact. That's part of your family communications plan. Sign up for Notify NYC. Uh, I, I, that's, a, that's really a must have. There's also a Ready New York uh, app. Sign up for that too. You can download that on your smartphone and that can help you in uh, some of the planning steps and some of the information with uh, preparedness. Um, the advanced warning system is you work for organizations and there's a 311 app to report things to the city. I, I would again make clear that on your smartphone, your smartphone might not be alive the whole time. So anything that you're dependent on your smartphone, like phone numbers and such, maybe 30 years ago, we remembered uh, some of our most important numbers. Now we don't. And so have a paper copy of that in case your smartphone goes out. It says here, uh, locate your uh, hurricane flood zone and evacuation center and discover the routes to get there. Look for alter alternates. If you're going there and, uh, and you're not using public transportation, uh, maybe you're parking. And even if you're taking like an Uber, had he traveled the last 500 feet, it might be pretty jammed. And so think about uh, how you traveled the last 500 feet. If you have mobility issues, that's an important thing to consider and plan on before you actually get to an evacuation center. As I said, collect important documentation, paper and digital copies. And the last suggestion is making a plan for a plan. And as I'd said in one of the first slides, some people can get stressed out on doing this and then they don't ever get it done. Uh, devote uh, 30 to 60 minutes, one or two times a week to complete your plans, your go bag, your stay box with your home supplies and tell a friend or relative that you're doing this to nudge you along the way towards completion and have them keep nudging you un until you complete. Uh, both uh, parents or children. So if you have a parent, um, maybe they can nudge you. If you have children, maybe they can nudge you. But let someone else know that you're doing this and this way it gets done. I promise you, you will f feel less stress when the disaster arrives and you realize, hey, I've taken care of everything. Uh, it's right in my go bag or my stay box. I know what to do. Now, that won't uh, diminish all the stress from responding to hazard, but at least you'll feel comfortable that many of the things that you could do for preparation, you've already done and you're ready to go. So in summary, preparedness is really important because it reduces stress, it saves lives, and uh, it applies uh, uh, in several angles here with your family, preparing the family, preparing your home, preparing uh, for your medical support. Maybe you're planning uh, being prepared at work. Maybe you're thinking about uh, transportation before and during and after a hazard. Maybe you're thinking about important services that you need. Preparedness makes it easier to respond and it also makes it easier to recover. Better preparedness makes us more resilient. And that's something that will help you in many ways uh, in your journey um, in response to any hazard or disaster. I'm going to ask, are there any questions? I don't see any hands raised. So thank you everyone for listening and again, we do this monthly presentation for Roosevelt Island on the fourth Thursday every month 
at 8 p.m. So hopefully we'll see you at the next uh, webinar for Roosevelt Island. That'll be in October. And we'll be looking towards some of the hazards as we get into the fall season. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for listening. My name is Frank Ferrantz. My email address, which is on the first slide, but I'll say it again, is frank at ferrantz.com. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And again, be safe. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the community on Roosevelt Island. Thank you and good night.